Our gospel lesson for today continues where we were last week in Matthew. We are in the book of Matthew, the fifth chapter, and we're doing the 38th through 48th verses today. Matthew 5, 38 through 48. Lose the big All right. So he's continuing, Jesus is continuing his sermon on the mount. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you that, that you must not oppose those who want to hurt you. If people slap you on your right cheek, you must turn the left cheek to them as well. When they wish to haul you to court and take your shirt, let them have your coat, too. When they force you to go one mile, go with them, too. Give to those who ask, and don't refuse those who wish to borrow from you. You have heard it said, you must love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who harass you, so that you will be acting as children of your Father who is in heaven. He makes the sun rise on both the evil and the good and sends rain on both the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love only those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, just as your heavenly Father is complete in showing love to everyone, so you must be complete. Also, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Will you go with me and to the Lord in prayer? Now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you this day, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Sorry, I need a little sip of water here for coffee. <clears throat> Today's sermon is going to be just a little bit different in that a vast majority of it will not be my words, but words that I believe were definitely handed down by God to a prophet. And that I have no doubt, and for that reason, I feel they are needed to be heard today. Last week, we focused on Jesus providing four new laws to his disciples that believers needed to follow in order to be in line with God's will for our lives. If you'll remember, those four new laws were regarded murder, adultery, marriage, and divorce, and the making of oaths. This week, we're going to take a look at the final two laws which <clears throat> Jesus provided his followers. They are the new law regarding revenge and the new law of love. Now, negotiating this scripture can be quite difficult and disconcerting for some people because Jesus tells us not to seek revenge against those who have harmed us. And additionally, we're told that we should love our enemies. When we are harmed repeatedly by another, it is extremely difficult when we hear that Jesus expects us to turn the other cheek. Often when we are faced with a circumstance, we respond with a question along the lines of, well, just far, how far do I have to go? How many times am I expected to turn the other cheek? Later, that same question is, of course, asked by Peter when he asked Jesus in Matthew 18, 21 through 22, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. Jesus' answer in today's lesson, as well as Matthew 18, was quite unexpected for this time. Because the people of Israel were living under three known laws that were generally accepted by all people. These laws, Mosaic law, by the way, was one of them. The Code of Hammurabi and even Roman law all required that the wrongdoers should get back as good as they gave. By the time Jesus, however, by the time of Jesus, however, those laws 
were changing such that an injured person could take the person who hurt them to court and get some sort of monetary settlement for their troubles. At least in this way, the perpetrator was at least guaranteed that friends of the injured wouldn't come seeking their own form of justice. So when Jesus tells his followers to give up their cloak as well, he's telling them to go the extra step to right the wrong committed. Then once again, Jesus reminds us and everyone to care for those in need by telling them to give to those who beg and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow. In a, in a recent Bible study, we talked a lot about these people that were called the least of these. And they weren't just the good or the bad, but everyone in God's kingdom that were in need of help. And from there, Jesus transitioned into perhaps the most difficult passage in the Sermon on the Mount for us to subscribe to, that of loving our enemies. Someone who understood quite a lot about loving our enemies within an environment of hatred was the slain civil rights leader, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. From an early age, he, along with millions of blacks living in the segregated South, knew what it was like to be hated. So to be abused at the hands of whites who just hated them for no real reason. I know that many of us gathered here today grew up in an era of racial instability. Once I thought that the legacy of hatred suffered by our nation during the 1960s and 70s was long dead and buried. But with the events of the past few years, the shootings of unarmed black men, the racial lines that seem to be forming again, the social unrest created by lawgivers hell-bent on bettering themselves at the expense of the poor, the elderly, and the disenfranchised, and yes, even the middle class, and the uncertainty of our nation and world today as leaders make decisions that leave many scratching their heads it seems that the dream of a peaceful time in the nation and in the world are far from dead and buried. If there are any here today who harbor any of that sentiment, I pray that you will not be offended by this sermon today. In Disciple Fast Track the other night, a participant asked if we still had prophets. And I responded that I'm sure we do, However, what I didn't say is that they're often muted by the cacophony of other voices in the world today. But in my opinion, the last great prophet we had in the world was Dr. King. His words on the matter that we're talking about today are some of the most eloquent that I've ever read. And I believe that King's words must be shared with this world and remembered for their truth and honesty, but more importantly, for their love and devotion to Jesus' teachings. Now I'm going to provide for you this excerpt from a sermon that he gave called Loving Your Enemies, which was delivered at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama on November 17, 1957. Please listen to these words that Dr. King shared and listen for the relevancy in today's world. Loving your enemies is so basic to me because it is part of my basic philosophical and theological orientation. The whole idea of love, the whole philosophy of love. In the fifth chapter of the gospel, as recorded by St. Matthew, we read these very arresting words flowing from the lips of our Lord and Master. You've heard it said that it has been said, thou shalt love your neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despitefully use you, that ye may be children of your Father which is in heaven. Certainly, these are great words, words lifted to cosmic proportions. And over the centuries, many persons have argued that this is an extremely difficult command. Many would go so far as to say that it's just impossible to move out into the actual practice of this glorious command. They would say, go on. To, they would go on to say that this is just an additional proof that Jesus was an impractical idealist who never quite came down to earth. So the arguments abound. But far from being impractical as an idealist, Jesus 
has become the practical realist. The words of this text glitter in our eyes with a new urgency. Far from being the pious injunction of a utopian dreamer, this command is an absolute necessity for the survival of our civilization. Yes, it is love that will save our world and our civilization, love even for enemies. Now let me hasten to say that Jesus was very serious when he gave this command. He wasn't playing. He realized that it's hard to love your enemies. He realized that it's difficult to love those persons who seek to defeat you, those persons who say evil things about you. He realized that it was painfully hard, pressingly hard. This is a basic philosophy of all that we hear coming from the lips of our master. Because Jesus wasn't playing, because he was serious, we have the Christian and moral responsibility to seek and to discover the meaning of these words and to discover how we can live out this command and why we should live out this command. First, let us deal with this question, which is the practical question. How do you go about loving your enemies? I think the first thing is this. In order to love your enemies, you must begin by analyzing self. And I'm sure that seems strange to you that I start out talking to you this morning that you love your enemies by beginning to look at yourself. It seems to me that it is the first and foremost way to come to an adequate discovery of how to fix the solution. Now, I'm aware of the fact that some people will not like you. Not because of something you have done to them, but just because they don't like you. I'm quite aware of that. Some people aren't going to like the way you walk. Some people aren't going to like the way you talk. Some people aren't going to like you because you can do their jo their, your job better than they can do theirs. Some people aren't going to like you because other people like you and because you're popular and because you're well-liked, they aren't going to like you. Some people aren't going to like you because your hair is a little shorter than theirs or your hair is a little longer than theirs. Some people aren't going to like you because your skin is a little brighter than theirs and others aren't going to like you because your skin is a little darker than theirs. They aren't, they're going to dislike you, not because of something that you've done to them, but because of various jealous reactions and other reactions that are so prevalent in human nature. But after looking at these things and admitting these things, we must face the fact that an individual might dislike us because of something that we've done deep down in the past some personality attribute that we possess, something that we've done deep down in the past and we've forgotten about it, but it was that something that aroused the hate response within the individual. That is why I say begin with yourself. There might be something within you that arouses the tragic hate response in the other individual. And this is what Jesus means when he said, how is it that you see the splinter in your brother's eye and fail to see the plank in your own eye? And this is one of the tragedies of human nature. So we begin to love our enemies and to love those persons that hate us in collective life or individual life by looking at others. A second thing that an individual must do in seeking love to, of his enemy is to discover the element of good in his enemy. And every time you begin to hate that person and think of hating that person, realize that there is some good there and that those good points must be overbalanced and they must overbalance the bad points. I've said to you on many occasions that each of us is something of a schizophrenic personality. We split up and divided against ourselves. And there is something of a civil war going on within our own lives. There is a recalitrant south of our soul revolting against the north of our soul. And there is this continual struggle with the very structure of every individual life. There is something within all of us that causes us to cry out with the Apostle Paul. I see and approve the better things of life, but the evil things I do. This simply means this, that within the best of us, there is some evil and within the worst of us, there is some good. When we come to see this, we take a different attitude toward individuals. 
The person who hates you the most has some good in him. Even the nation that hates you the most has some good even in it. Even the race that hates you the most has some good in it. And when you come to the point that you look in the face of every man and see deep down within him what religion calls the image of God, you begin to love him in spite of. No matter what he does, you see God's image there. There is an element of goodness that you can never slough off. Discover the element of good in your enemy. And as you seek to hate him, find the center of goodness and place your attention there and you will have a new attitude. Another way to love your enemy is this. When the opportunity presents itself for you to defeat your enemy, that is the time you must not do it. There will come a time in many instances when the person who hates you the most, the person who misused you the most, the person who gossiped about you most, the person who has spread false rumors about you most, there will come a time when you will have an opportunity to defeat that person. It might be in terms of recommendation for a job. It might be in terms of helping that person to make some move in life. That's the time you must not do it. That is the meaning of love. And the final analysis, love is not the sentimental something that we talk about. It's not merely an emotional something. Love is creative, understanding, goodwill for all men. It is the refusal to defeat any individual. When you rise to the level of love, of its great beauty and its power, you seek only to defeat evil systems. Individuals who happen to be caught up in that system, you love, but you seek to defeat the system. Agape, along with eros and philia, are three words the ancient Greeks used to describe our word love. Agape is something of the understanding, creative, redemptive, goodwill for all men. It is love that seeks nothing in return. It is an overflowing love. It is what theologians would call the love of God working in the lives of men. And when you rise to this level of love, you begin to love men. Not because they are likable, but because God loves them. You look at every man and you love him because you know God loves him. And he might be the worst person you've ever seen. And this is what Jesus means, I think, in this very passage when he says, love your enemy. It is significant that he does not say, like your enemy. Like is a sentimental something, an affectionate something. Jesus says, love them. And love is greater than like. Love is understanding, redemptive goodwill for all men so that you love everybody because God loves them. You refuse to do anything that will defeat an individual because you have agape in your soul. And here you come to the point that you love the individual who does the evil deed while hating the deed that the person does. This is what Jesus means when he says, love your enemy. This is the way to do it. When the opportunity presents itself, when you can defeat your enemy, you must not do it. It's not only necessary to know how to go about loving your enemies, but also to go down into the question of why we should love our enemies. I think the first reason that we should love our enemies, and I think that this is the very center of Jesus' thinking, is this. That hate for hate only intensifies the existence of of hate and evil in the universe. If I hit you and you hit me, and I hit you back and you hit me back and go on, you see that goes on ad infinitum. It just never ends. Somewhere, somebody has to have a little sense, and that's the strong person. The strong person is the person who can cut off the chain of hate, the chain of evil, and that is the tragedy of hate. That it doesn't cut off. It only intensifies the existence of hate and evil in the universe. Somebody must have religion enough and morality enough to cut it off and inject within the very structure of the universe that strong and powerful element of love. Now there is a final reason that I think Jesus says, love your enemies. 
it is this. That love has within it a redemptive power. And there is a power there that eventually transforms individuals. That's why Jesus says love your enemies. Because if you hate your enemies, you have no way to redeem and transform your enemies. But if you love your enemies, you will discover that at the very root of the love is the power of redemption. You just keep loving people and loving them. And even though they're mistreating you, you love them. Here's the person who is a neighbor. And this is the person doing something wrong to all of you. All of that. Just keep being friendly to that person. Keep loving them. Don't do anything to embarrass them. Just keep loving them. And they can't stand it too long. Oh, they react in many ways in the beginning. They react with bitterness because they're mad, because you love them like that. Then they react with guilt feelings, and sometimes they'll hate you a little bit more at that transition period. But just keep loving them. And by the power of your love, they will break down under the load. That's love, you see. It is redemptive, and that is why Jesus says love. There's something about love that builds up and is creative. There is something about love that tears down, about hate, that tears down and is destructive. So love your enemies. That's it. There is a power in love that our world has not yet discovered. Jesus discovered it centuries ago. Mahatma Gandhi of India discovered it. But most men and most women never discover it. For they believe in hitting for hitting. They believe in an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. They believe in hating for hating. But Jesus comes to us and says, that isn't the way. But there is another way. And that is to organize mass nonviolent resistance against the principle of love. It based on the principle of love, excuse me. It seems to me that this is the only way as our eyes look to the future. As we look out across the years and across the generations, let us develop and move right here. We must discover the power of love, the power, the redemptive power of love. And when we discover that, we will be able to make of this old world a new world. We will be able to make men better. Love is the only way. Jesus discovered that. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.